Klingon, Dothraki, High Valerian, Elvish. Why would someone make up a language? Better yet, at that point, why would anyone turn around and learn it? This is Thomas from Esperanto Variety Show, and recently I was included on the podcast Multilinguish, which is from the language learning app Babbel. Multilinguish did an episode all about constructed languages, or conlangs, and a clip from Esperanto Variety Show was included, sort of towards the end of the episode, and uh, so listening along, there were times that I wanted to sort of jump in and correct things. I received a request from a friend to not only talk about things that I thought they got wrong, but also to sort of highlight some things that they got right in the podcast as well. So that's what we're going to do today. I will have a link to the podcast in the description. And by the way, welcome to anybody who's here who found us through Multilinguish. Thanks for checking us out. I will say the one thing that really jumped out at me about the podcast and being part of that experience, even if it was just using a short clip of Esperanto Variety Show and then talking about it, was the way they described my channel. It's, you know, you do a YouTube channel, you try to tell people what it's all about, and then to have somebody else tell you about it, you think, you know what, I think he did a better job explaining that than I did. And he said that Esperanto Variety Show is about sharing the joys of learning Esperanto and the challenges and getting others to recognize how cool it can be and why it's worthwhile. Um, that's absolutely true. My summary for the mission is, I want you to be the best Esperanto speaker you can be. By the way, the, uh, the, the bulk of the podcast is about con uh, constructed languages in general. And then maybe the last third, in round numbers I didn't measure it, but in the last third they talk a little bit more specifically about Esperanto. I do want to point out that this is going to be a relatively long response. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it shorter than the original podcast. If now is not a good time to listen to something in a longer format, go ahead and add this to your watch later. I have some instructions on the screen on how to do that. I also want to underscore that I have a conlang slash oxlang playlist. I'll have the link in, in the description and also showing up above. Um, maybe it's now's a good time to talk a little bit about terms. Conlang, of course, is a constructed language, and that can be any kind of language that somebody has invented, whether for a TV show like Dothraki or High Valerian or uh, Pakuni from Land of the Lost, um, or it could be something from literature like Elvish from J.R.R. Tolkien's books, or it could be a language that's meant to have some additional purpose, um, and they talk about that in a lot of detail, and we'll get to that. Um, but then we talk about oxlangs, and oxlangs are specifically auxiliary languages. So they are typically constructed languages that are meant to be a help to additional languages. So rather than, you know, saying we're going to replace all these languages with this one language, everyone will still speak their regular language, but what language are they going to use to help them com communicate? And they talk about that a little bit towards the end of the podcast. Now, I was not familiar with Multilinguish before David reached out to me to ask me if he could use a clip from my channel, but, um, you know, I kind of meant to listen to some of the episodes beforehand, but, uh, you know, life happens. But I did get a chance to listen to this one, and I did find it very interesting. It was um, nice to see somebody else's perspective on it. A lot of times we hear about conlangs from people who either, who either know nothing about it or they're, like, fanatically into it. And so it was nice to sort of have this middle approach. So let me just set up the format a little bit. So David was hosting the podcast along with the, um, the content creation team from Babbel, as I understand it, which is a language learning app. Beyond that, honestly, I don't know a whole lot about the, the app. Um, it might be nice to check it out someday, but uh, at this time, I do not believe they teach Esperanto. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on learning and teaching Esperanto at the time. I do want to point out they have the whole discussion transcribed on their webpage as well, and that same link is in the description. So anyway, in, right into the podcast. One of the things that drove me crazy listening to this podcast is that David was David was talking to somebody in the room named Thomas, and I kept thinking, oh, he's talking to me. I mean, you mentioned Elvish Thomas um, from Star Wars. There's like hut ease, mm. um, the language of the huts, which I don't know if there's like a full... If you could go online and actually learn how to use, um, but it's, it exists, you know, it's an idea that there is a language out there that's spoken by a very specific subset of characters. Um, and I'm sure there are people out there who tried to learn them. Yes, I did actually men <laughs> mention Elvish in my introduction here. Now, one thing that is 
interesting about Huttese is Star Wars is actually notoriously bad about being consistent with the way it uses languages uh, on screen. Uh, oftentimes the words are taken from national languages and don't relate to what's being said on screen. There's one example that immediately springs to mind with Kanji Club, and that is when Han Solo, is his ship is being raided by Kanji Club, uh, Kanji Club <laughs> and there are two clips that have the exact same sound in them. Um, in one case, he's saying, it's over for you, Solo. And in the next case, the exact same sound pattern means twice. You're both going to get what I promise. Have I ever not delivered for you before? Yeah. I don't know for sure that's the case with Hatties. Um, I did go out after hearing this and look up, and there are some websites about Hatties. Um not very comprehensive and really not the sort of thing you could learn given that it's mostly um, just made up by uh, f fans at this point. I will say while we're on the topic of Huttese that one of my uh, favorite bits of trivia or favorite points of uh, clarification is the expression Banta Pudu, which everybody, well not everybody, but quite a few Star Wars fans will recognize that because it's always on the screen and it's been used more than once, Banta Pudu. And the subtitles always say that means bantha fodder. What's interesting to me is how many people will say that it means poop. <laughs> it doesn't mean poop. Fodder is not poop, it's food. And so pudu is basically the English word food, pronounced with different phonetics. So it seems to me pretty clear that banta pudu is literally bantha food, not bantha poop. I just thought I'd set the record straight. So Steph then talks a little bit about coming up with a term to describe fan fiction and conlangs together. So the idea is people go out and, like what happened to Hatties, people go out and try to complete languages that were made by, for the, from their TV show. I've seen that happen in Pakuni. Certainly it's happened with Hatties. I wonder if you could mash fanfic and conlang together to make like w one word that is comprised of four pieces. So for that, I'm going to go for fanflang. I just made that up, a fan flang. A fan flang. <laughs> Actually, I like that. I do think that, that fan flangs cause a lot of confusion with the Pakuni language, which is another story. Pakuni from the Land of the Lost. Um, there was not a whole lot of information out there, and so when people go out and make stuff up in addition to that, it uh, when you go out later and try to find out something about the language, you can't tell whether you're... Um, reading the fanfic or whether you're reading what's actually was written by the author of the language. So in order to talk about constructed languages, we need to talk about what a language really is. I really like this definition that Eileen put forward. I mean, one pretty common definition, I think, of a language is that it has to have uh, native speakers. So like it has to actually have people who learn it from birth uh, for it to be a language. So I guess uh, that doesn't really apply to Constructed, la constructed languages, except for a few, I guess. I do think there's oftentimes too much of an emphasis on native speakers, and we do talk about how Esperanto has native speakers, and I certainly know many people who have been around Esperanto s from a very young age and have learned to, sp learned to speak Esperanto along with their local national language. Um, but in terms of defining what Esperanto is and defining what any language is, it doesn't really come down to native speakers. I also think um, one of the big differences is that a natural language is sort of like a participative like community process, right? Because it's sort of um, something that kind of cohesively evolves with the input of many people, whereas a conlang is usually the product of one person's imagination. One person is sort of creating the entire system and all of the rules. And I do like what was said later on in the discussion about how language is a product of multiple people working together using it, which I think defines Esperanto very well. Although Esperanto was initially set out there on the world by one person, it, it is the community of Esperantists, Esperanto speakers, who define what Esperanto is and have really helped Esperanto to grow, just like any other language would grow. So are there babies out there speaking the Thraki right now? That's a great question. That would, yeah, I don't know. No. The answer to that is almost certainly no. It, it really is a, a, a major undertaking to speak a language with a child, enough to the point where you can consider that one of their native languages. 
there is one story of somebody who did that with Klingon. Uh, this, I, it's not the sort of thing you would expect to see happen again. And with a language like Dothraki, which is not as widely spoken or not as fluently spoken even as Klingon, which, um, by the way, a lot of people overestimate the, the fluency of the Klingon speakers out there. There are a few very fluent speakers, but not a whole lot. I would not expect um, there to be a native speaker of really anything um, at this point other than Esperanto. You also need to have a, for it to be a living language, for real, you need to have a system of bringing in new words. Like, for it to be a living language, you have to also be able to say microwave in Dothraki. And, like, that system needs to be in place at, uh, also, like, apart from all the... Uh, basic grammar that you need and then you also probably for it to be you know classified as living there has to be words that go out of use as well as we see in natural like more organically um, uh, developed languages so specifically with regard to Dothraki it's worth keeping in mind that it is a fictional language that takes place in a fictional universe the Dothraki people don't have microwaves, therefore there won't be a word in Dothraki for microwave, and there never will be. But, again, I think what they're getting at here is what happens then if you try to release the language onto the world, into the world and have people use it. Then, yes, there does have to be a system in place for where these words come from. In a fictional language, usually the author of the language will come up with the word on their own. Um, but with if the word is... if, if if it's a language that's really meant to be used, basically what happens, or what, what seems to work best, is that you treat it like any other language. When, before we all had microwaves in our, in our house, remember, there was no word in English for microwave. Somebody had to invent it. And they said, well, the, one person said, I want to call it a microwave. Somebody else said, I want to call it a microwave oven. And other people say, I want to call it a, uh, a kitchen zapper. Um, <laughs> By the way, my kids uh, don't know what zapping means, which is, that was a verb that we used to talk about microwaving things back when I was a kid, right? So sometimes these words catch on, sometimes they don't. And that's how that works in languages that were languages that were originally constructed. Now in the podcast, they do interview uh, Ben Dumond from uh, YouTube, somebody else I'm not familiar with. He, do, he does have some interesting th things to say, so I'm just going to throw that out there. Make sure you, uh, if you'd like to get into more detail, to listen to the original podcast. Now, I do like what uh, the other Thomas said here, Thomas Devlin. He's, he reacted to something that, that Ben said, and let's have a listen. I just think it's so hard to learn a language that lots of people speak. The idea of learning for a fan community is just so wild to me. Because, like, I think of learning Spanish, and I'm like, eh. It's so hard, but there are people who are becoming fluent with these languages that only maybe a few hundred other people speak, and it's for fun. It's a different mindset that fascinates me. Now, I'm not convinced that hundreds of people are becoming fluent in these languages. It was said once that the number of fluent Klingon speakers could comfortably sit down to dinner together. Several years later, they said, well, maybe at a big table. But still, we're not, I'm not expecting there to be hundreds of speakers of Dothraki. I know I personally went out uh, on the Duolingo site and looked at the amount of activity in the forums for Klingon and Dothraki, because according to the public statistics on Duolingo, there are more active, quote-unquote, active learners for Klingon and High Valerian than there are for Esperanto. At the same time, we don't really know what they mean by active learner. And if you look at the number of new sentence threads and questions being asked, the Esperanto forum is far more active. So I, th I think what we see is a lot of people getting out there and dabbling in it, but not actually becoming fluent. What, what uh, Thomas said there really resonated with me, this idea of it being difficult to learn a language that even a lot of people speak. Uh, we run into that um, in Esperanto um, in terms of learning materials. We have There's a lot of good basic learning materials. And then to get into the intermediate materials, you've got fewer to pick from. And that's just the way it is. The, there are other constructed auxiliary languages that I've dabbled in, and you feel that pain there a lot stronger. It's just, it's, I just, you know, I personally find it easier to dabble in five romance languages than to learn a language like interlinguist simply because you can go anywhere and get, 
you know, a quick lesson in French or a quick lesson in in Spanish. The material in Interlingua, you've got to kind of basically make your own, and, and it is it is it is challenging to learn a language when there is no budget behind it <laughs> to produce good learning materials. The other thing that comes to mind when I think about this is with Esperanto, people will say they've had more success learning Esperanto than they have learning other languages, um, national languages. And that, that is really true up to a point. Um, and I think this, this comes back to the whole question of how do you say microwave in Dothraki? Um, you know, there was a time when I was speaking Esperanto at home and I was also trying to speak German at the same time, um, different, well, in that same time of my life. And I, f I found that although speaking German was far more challenging on a, on a basic level, anytime I had a problem with, you know, how do you say this, I would find a German speaker and I'd say, how do you say diaper? How do you say sippy cup? How do you, you know, how do you say temper tantrum, right? And uh, those sorts of things, you get a quick answer, you know the answer. You find out maybe they say it differently in Switzerland uh, as opposed to Bavaria, but, uh, you know, beyond that. On the other hand, trying to do the same thing for Esperanto, you think, well, do I just make something up and run with it? Or do I invest the time into finding, you know, a, something really good and really suitable that, uh, you know, I, th I think is a really good choice there. And so I end, up, I end up spending a lot more time coming up with answers to those. So, yeah, yeah, Thomas, I really do feel that pain there. You need just to have people that you can practice it with for your own sake, too. If you want to be able to get better and become fluent in the language, whatever fluency means to you, you can't just do it by yourself. You can't just look at YouTube tutorials and read books. You have to be able to get together with other people and practice just like you would with any natural language. Yeah. The timing of David's comment here is interesting in the light of uh, some of the things I've been p uh, putting out on my Facebook page about the ne the the need to jump in right to learn Esperanto. You're not going to learn you're not going to learn Esperanto or any language from a book or an app. That ultimately you need to have as your goal and actually have as part of your learning process talking to people. And I really think the sooner you do that, the um, the quicker you'll learn, even even as a beginner. And I'm pretty sure the people on the podcast will agree with that. Circling back a little bit to the question of people becoming fluent in these languages, I'm reminded of my experience with Pakuni from Land of the Lost. Um, I had this idea a few years ago that I wanted to learn it, and it turns out there were no materials for it. So I had to go out and transcribe the, the language in the show. And you get to a point where you're like, okay, well, now that I've learned it, and, and I've since met there are one or two other people who have gone out and, and learned it to the same extent I have. Um, and we get, I get in touch with these people and we think, all right, well now, now what can we do with it? We've got a language with a few hundred words. It was used in a TV show in a fictional world. Um, and people say, well, how do you, how do you sing the theme song in Pakuni, the theme song to the TV show? And uh, so now we have to come up, well, do we could treat those as loan words that are brought in phonetically? And, um, you know, are we stepping on the, the memory, as it were? Is, is, this, is adding words to this language equivalent of drawing a mustache on the Mo a Mona Lisa? You know, these are things that you do deal with when you're interested in uh, fictional languages. 31 minutes in, they have uh, a little commercial. Okay, it's time for a language learning lightning round. You snap your fingers and you can be fluent in any language. Which language would it be and why? Thomas? Well, thanks for asking. Yeah, I know you were talking to the other Thomas, but um, I have been asked this question before. I think it was actually one of my, in my Ask Me Anything on, uh, that I did for the patri patrons. My thought is Mandarin because, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, Mandarin is sort of a useful language in terms of the number of people who speak it. And um, it's the sort of thing that, that I have tried a little bit to learn. It feels to me like it's the sort of thing that would take a lot of work. So if the genie is going to give me the chance to learn a language for free with no effort, uh, definitely Mandarin. For those of you who are less interested in conlanging in general, I do want to point out that at 33 minutes into the podcast, that's when they talk more about languages that are meant to be used in the real world. I do think David does a very good job of summarizing what Esperanto is and where it came from and why it exists, a little bit of the history of it, um, going into at least the first oh, four or five minutes of his uh, discussion about, about Esperanto. 
I am not fully convinced that we could say Esperanto kind of died out between the world wars. Certainly it didn't grow during those times and world wars certainly are a setback to a number of different things. But Esperanto really has been in constant daily use for 132 years and is the language of the Esperanto community. But it was really nice to hear somebody who might not actually speak Esperanto giving such a clear summary of Esperanto because there there are a lot of People will, 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 will know just, just enough about Esperanto to be dangerous and then uh, talk about it like they know what they're talking about. Um, and it's actually interesting the number of times in my life that I have been lectured by people who tell me what Esperanto is, even after I tell them, yeah, I've been speaking Esperanto every day for the last 20 years. They still want to tell me a little bit about it. So, David, thank you for your summary. I'll also add that when we want to talk about how many people speak Esperanto, the answer really is we don't know. The number two million does get thrown out, does get thrown around a lot. That was published in the World Almanac. There are there have been endless discussions about whether the methods that they used were um, were accurate. If we fudge what we mean by speaker, I'm sure we can come up with two million people who speak Esperanto, regardless of what the facts are, simply by fudging what it means to be a speaker. But there, there, there are certainly there's more than a hundred, there's more than a thousand, there's more than uh, probably ten thousand people who can have a conversation in Esperanto. And the other thing is about native speakers. A thousand, that was a number that was also just sort of picked out of thin air, ballpark figure. It's somewhere close to the truth, I would say. On the subject of native speakers, though, I do want to correct one little detail. He says that I still speak Esperanto um, at home with, with my family. We do use Esperanto, usually not at home at this point. This was something we did when the kids were small. As they got older, we, we spoke a little less Esperanto at home, simply because we were just, just really confronted with English and the, the, the local language all the time. They do come along to Esperanto events and have had the opportunity to use Esperanto there, and, and everyone in my family at this point still does uh speak Esperanto. On a day-to-day basis at home, it's the sort of thing that sort of comes up. Oh, hey, here's something that happened. And then I can, you know, explain the details of the story in Esperanto without having to tell anybody what they actually mean. But yeah, at this point in our life, we, uh, we speak English at home. And I want to play a clip for you of Esperanto as well. He's a speaker who's been speaking it for about 20 years. His name is Thomas Alexander. In Esperanto, he calls himself Tommaso. And he has a YouTube channel called The Esperanto Variety Show, which is about sharing the joys of learning Esperanto and the challenges, getting other people to recognize how cool it can be and why it's worthwhile. David, as I said at the the opening of, of, of my response here, I do want to thank you for summer, doing such a great job of summarizing Esperanto Variety Show. Um, I put a little clip of that on my personal Facebook page. Uh, with your summary of, of, of the channel. So thank you for that. I will say it, it did feel a little bit spooky um, to hear the next part of the conversation after you introduce the clip and after people have had a chance to listen to it, to hear everybody sort of picking about picking it out, saying, oh, yes, he says this, he says that. Um, and knowing that they were talking about something that I had said. Um, by the way, for my viewers, I just want to mention the clip was from the introduction to the Ne Perfecta series that I made where I just one day I said, you know what, I've got to get rolling making videos again. I'm just going to go out and shoot something. So I was outside uh, standing in front of a tree talking about some of the things that I wanted to do in terms of um, making videos over the next couple of weeks. And that's the clip they played. It felt Russian, but I think that was a lot of the accent kind of yeah. gave it a Russian flavor and mm -hmm. also Portuguese kind of. Yeah, a little yeah. bit of that. I, I got that. Well, thank you, Thomas Devlin, for that uh, for that comment about my accent. Um, <laughs> I actually don't speak Russian or uh, Portuguese, um, but uh, yeah. So the fact that it did not sound American to you is something that that, or maybe you were too kind to say that. But thank you for for, for noticing. Uh, <laughs> it's funny because actually both um, both the reactions. This is something I hear all the time. People always say, "Oh, can you speak something in Esperanto?" And so I'll say something. And they'll say, oh, it sounds like Spanish. Oh, it sounds like... I'm not sure where people come up with that, but it was interesting to hear you guys analyzing it. And certainly my hat is off to David for correctly picking out a few of the words that I said in the clip. What I didn't really get a sense of was a lot of Asian languages. And I think there's been... If anyone were to criticize Esperanto, it's probably for the fact that it it's more you know, heavily inclined to pull from the Romance language families or the Germanic language families. Yeah. So maybe that means it's not as accessible to everyone. I will say, I, I, this is something I hear fairly often, and quite honestly, I don't have a whole lot of 
patience for that criticism of Esperanto. Esperanto ultimately is what it is. It's a language that people speak. It's the language of the Esperanto community. And, uh, you know, adding a bunch of Chinese words to Esperanto wouldn't necessarily make it any better. Um, you know, when we talk about, well, what's, you know, what's English or what's French, people never say, oh, well, it doesn't have enough Chinese words in it. Um, there are certainly are attempts to make auxiliary languages with Chinese words in them and Arabic words in them, but uh, they're not Esperanto. Personally, my own thought is it's just it would be crazy to try to get a new language project off the ground at this at this point in history. People are certainly welcome to try if that's their passion and they enjoy it, and they're and hopefully they can be a little bit realistic about it at the same time. Uh, I went into a lot more detail about this in what I call the vocabulary problem on the um, in the playlist of oxlangs and conlangs and what would be the, the, the best world language. So um, make sure you check out that uh, link in the description if that's something that's interesting to you. One of the only facts that I know about it is that George Soros is a native speaker and George Soros is like a big liberal donor. Yeah, this little tidbit about George Soros comes up uh, from time to time. Um, by the way, at the, at the outtakes, you guys sing the song uh, Desperado with the word Esperanto. There's a great t video on YouTube where somebody has come up with an entire set of lyrics to that tune. Um, and he mentions uh, in the song, even George Soros loves you. Uh, but that sadly is not the case. It would be nice if we had uh, somebody with that kind of uh, wherewithal backing the language. But um, he, uh, he he's, he's apparently is not a big fan of the language. He, uh, he, he grew up speaking it. And, uh, you know, this is just something that happens, Some you know, your parents have a hobby, your parents have an interest, and you have a different interest. That's uh, kind of the way life goes sometimes. I just don't know how it would work if you actually tried to apply. Because it seems like since it's simplified, it probably doesn't have the same expressiveness as like a French or Chinese or any other language. So in French, there's a rule that certain adjectives go before the noun and certain adjectives go after the noun. Um, in Spanish, there are rules about forming the past tense that have to do with uh, finding the participle based on which table it's from and whether it's a regular verb or irregular verb, and then using the correct auxiliary verb and conjugating that verb correctly. So that's what we mean when we say Esperanto is simplified. What we mean is that Esperanto doesn't have that. Esperanto doesn't say, well, certain, ver certain adjectives go before the noun and certain adjectives go after. Esperanto doesn't have... Um, I tell the story. I said I, did, I took a lesson with a, with a teacher on Spanish. You know, I've been learning Spanish a, a long time, never really seriously. And she said, well, what did you do yesterday? And I said, well, and I said, this is all in Spanish. I said, well, I'm sorry, I have not really learned past tense yet. And she said, well, that's okay. Just say it in present tense, and I'll know that you mean past tense. And we had an hour-long conversation in Spanish. Later on, I did the same thing with a different teacher. He said, that's okay, I'll correct you. And for an hour, it was the longest hour of my life while he corrected every single time that I said what, I was, what I'm was, what i doing when I really mean to say, as, am I done? If that were a lesson in Esperanto, I would say, that's okay. Just instead of saying completigas, say completigis. Just change the second to last letter from as to is, and now, now you know past tense. So that's what we really mean when we say a language like Esperanto is simplified. Not that it's really less expressive. Well, what do we think about the community of speakers of Esperanto? It seems like if you're going to learn any constructed language, Esperanto is by far the most recognized and the most spoken across the world. Do you think that that is enough of a reason to learn Esperanto because you have people to practice with and you have ways to learn? Do you feel like it's a worthwhile endeavor for you? It's certainly the fact that you can learn Esperanto is not enough reason by it in and of itself to actually learn it. Uh, I would say my answer to this question here is the reason why somebody would want to learn Esperanto is because they are interested in the Esperanto community. So the question needs to become, what is the Esperanto community? Why are people learning Esperanto? And what would be the benefits of speaking Esperanto? Um, you know, it's uh, there's a lot of discussion. Um, when people come up saying, "Well, yeah, the international idea, international language is a great idea. Auxiliary language is a great idea, but it's never going to work." And meanwhile, Esperanto continues existing, regardless of, of of what we say about that conversation. 
Um, the purpose of Esperanto, the so-called uh, interna ideo, that is the internal idea of Esperanto, is so that we can meet somebody from a different culture and tear down the language barrier and meet them on neutral ground and sort of see them as a fellow human being and not as some other who we can't talk to. That's the idea that, draw, that draws people to Esperanto. So the question isn't, do you want to go to a conference to speak Esperanto just because there are people there. The question is, do you like that idea that there are people out there that, you know, they're learning Esperanto because they want to talk to you? Does that idea appeal to you? If it does, I'd love to see you learn Esperanto. If it doesn't, um, learn something else. That's totally fine. Well, I think that's probably a good place to wrap up my thoughts at this point. So, uh, I would like to invite you again to check out the, the full pop podcast, which the link for which will be in the description. And also, if you're interested in the, in the topic of constructed languages and world languages and auxiliary languages, I do have a, the first two episodes of my Conlang series that's available on the playlist over here. So thank you for listening. Thanks for watching. And uh, I'll see you next time.